Well, after my dad passed away, people who went to church with him at what's now our LeCount campus talked about how he was there every Sunday, no matter how bad he felt while fighting cancer in the last year or so of his life. He attended every Sunday until about two months before he died when just health got to where he could not go anymore. Many people said that my dad's faithful church attendance was a powerful testimony to them. And while I was uh, pleased that, that dad set that testimony, I really wasn't surprised because that's how I was raised. I still remember one Sunday uh, when I was a boy, downpours had come overnight, and we lived on the LSUA campus, which has always had drainage problems. And uh, overnight, there was so much rain that our yard and our carport were filled with inches of water. Well, it never crossed my parents' mind to stay home that day. We all just put on rubber boots, took our church shoes in our hands, got in dad's truck since it was higher than mom's car, and we headed to church that day. Going to church was a priority, and dad led the way. And while worship was a priority, I don't think dad went to church while terminally ill or made sure that we all went to church in a flood because he had to. He went because he wanted to. Because he got to. You see, going to church is more than a priority. It's a privilege. Because when we start the week right, it usually goes right. But when we start the week wrong, it always goes wrong. So dad lived the truth that we learned today. Ordering our week rightly demonstrates our love for God and it blesses us. So if you haven't already, turn in your copy of God's Word to Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. On this Father's Day, we continue our sermon series, 10 to Win, with a message entitled, We Order Our Week Rightly. You know, as I've shared before, that some of the commandments tell us things that we should not do, while other commandments tell us things we should do. And when God tells us something that we should not do, He is helping us avoid hurt. And when He tells us some things we should do, He is helping us be blessed. Well, the fourth commandment contains both the positive and the negative. It tells us to not hurt ourselves by misordering our week, but it also tells us to help ourselves to the blessing of rest and worship. Uh, this fourth commandment is presented in three parts, and those parts are going to form the structure for today's message. In verse 8, we see what God wants us to do. In verses 9 and 10, we see how He wants us to do it. And in verse 11, He explains why we are to do it. What, how, and why. So let's look at this commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." So the qu first question of what, what does God want us to do? Well, he tells us clearly in verse 8, he wants us to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. But it's important that we ask, what does that word remember mean? Does it, does it mean merely to say, oh yeah, there, there's a day each week that is special? No, it's more than that. In fact, far more. That's why God adds that special instruction of keep it holy. This is not just a cognitive exercise any more than remembering your wedding anniversary is simply recalling it. There better be some concrete demonstration of remembrance for that anniversary. Rebecca and I celebrated our 22nd wedding anniversary last weekend. 
So, in preparation for our celebration, I made reservations at the Diamond Grill, because that's the most special place I guess you can go in Alexandria. I told them it was our anniversary. I had 22 pink roses, Rebecca's favorite, delivered to the restaurant ahead of time, so they'd be on our table. Now, why did I do all of that? Because June night is a holy day for us. And we remember it with action. And biblical remembrance of the Sabbath also requires action. The actions we take help set it apart as holy. Now think about this. What if last weekend for our anniversary I said, you know what, Rebecca, I love you. I'm glad I married you 22 years ago, but I'm just going to do some things for myself this weekend. I can tell by the way you're going, hmm, what, you know what would happen. I'd still be in trouble today, Father's Day or not. Right? That's be- and rightly so, because I would have failed to remember our anniversary and keep it Holy. When we fail to prioritize the Lord's day, we do the same thing. To keep a Sabbath to the Lord is to give the day over to God. We set it apart for Him and His glory. God has made the Sabbath a holy day, and when we treat it like any other day, or we consume it completely for ourselves, we sin against God. Sunday is only a fun day when it is used the right way. Before we move on, there's a question we need to ask and answer, though. Why do Christians worship on Sunday when the Sabbath is clearly the seventh day or Saturday? Well, we get some help in Colossians 2, verses 16 through 17, where Paul writes this. He says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or regarding a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Here's what I want you to see. These are a shadow of of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The Old Testament was a shadow of things that were to come. Jesus is the fulfillment. So our setting aside Sunday as the Lord's Day instead of Saturday as the Sabbath has everything to do with Jesus. The Old Testament Sabbath was the shadow. The Lord's Day is the transformation and fulfillment of the Sabbath into an even more blessed day. Interestingly, even the Old Testament portrayed a changing attitude toward the Sabbath. If you look here in the statement of the commandment here in Exodus chapter 20, the reason given is because of the creative activity of God. We take this break because God is the creator. Forty years later, when Moses restates the commandments for that second generation going into the promised land, the reason given is not creation, but the work in the Exodus. And that's why we now take time. We remember not only that he created the world, but that he redeemed the people from Egypt. Well, okay, so we see some transitioning in in, uh, the Old Testament, but how did we get from Saturday to Sunday? Well, the New Testament simply took the process one step further and altered the day, making the day of rest and worship fall on the first day of the week as a testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So instead of the the Sabbath, Saturday, celebrating creation or the Exodus redemption, the Lord's Day commemorates the greatest work of God, the work of redemption and salvation. uh, One pastor wrote, Saturday is the Sabbath of nature. Sunday is the day of grace. Saturday is the Sabbath of the rejected, crucified, entombed Christ. Sunday is the day of the risen, exalted, triumphant Christ. Sunday is the Creator's Day. Saturday is the Creator's Day. Sunday is the Redeemer's Day. So it was an easy shift for the early church to to make this shift when you consider that nearly everything that happened of significance after the cross happened on Sunday. It was on Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead. 
It was on Sunday that he first appeared to his disciples. It was on Sunday that he gave them the fuller understanding of the scriptures. It was on Sunday that Jesus first broke bread with them after the resurrection. It was on Sunday that Jesus gave the great commission. It was on Sunday that Jesus ascended to heaven. It was on Sunday that the Holy Spirit descended on the church. It was on Sunday that Jesus appeared to John and gave him the revelation on the Isle of Patmos. So yeah, that's why the church made the shift to Sunday as the Lord's Day, as the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. The Sabbath on Saturday was a shadow of the things to come. The Lord's Day celebrates the reality of what came. Noted theologian, pastor, and author James Montgomery Boyce writes this. He says, the fact that Sunday was established and the Sabbath abolished is seen in the speed and totality with which Sunday replaced the Sabbath in the worship of the early church. In the Old Testament, the word Sabbath is mentioned frequently. In the book of Acts, by contrast, the word is found only nine times, and not once is it said to be a day observed by Christians. Nowhere is it suggested that the church met on the Sabbath day or even regarded it with any special affection or attention. Therefore, in the church, pay attention to this, we do not observe the Saturday Sabbath, we celebrate the Lord's Day on Sunday. It's not just an observance, it's a celebration. Hopefully, in an even more special way than the Jews ever celebrated the Sabbath. Uh, The Sabbath was God's day under the Old Covenant. The Lord's day is His day under the New Covenant. Just as Jews remembered uh, His his work and, and the Sabbath by keeping it holy, so God wants us to remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. And so, that's what He wants us to do. God wants us to remember And take a Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, so how then does he want us to do that? How does God want us to do what he wants? Well, look at verses 9 and 10. He says, But the uh, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. God wants us. To remember his day by keeping it holy through good work during the week and rest on a Sabbath. God worked hard during the six days of creation. We have no idea and cannot fathom the amount of power he expended in speaking the universe into existence. And just as he worked hard, we are to work hard. Because rest is best when it is preceded by hard work. You know the expression, good tired, right? I've worked hard, and now I can enjoy the rest. The word Sabbath doesn't mean seven. It's similar to the Hebrew word seven. But the word Sabbath means rest. And what does rest involve? Well, It involves much more than a Sunday afternoon nap, though that is perfectly in line with Scripture. So you be religious this afternoon and take you a nap in Jesus' name. That'll be great. Likewise, resting on a Sabbath, it it also involves far more than simply not working. You know that the Pharisees got all wrapped up into making sure no one worked on the Sabbath. I mean, they turned what God meant for gladness into gloom. By the time of Jesus, uh, the Sabbath law was a complex system of legalistic hoops. For example, you, you could not wear false teeth on the Sabbath, or you'd probably want to leave them at home, because if they happened to fall out of your mouth and you had to reach down and pick them up, you had worked. You couldn't look in a mirror on the Sabbath, because you might see a gray hair that you need to pull out, and that would be work. Interestingly, you could spit on the Sabbath, but you had to be careful where you spit. Because if you spit in the dirt and you happen to scuff it with your sandal, you had just cultivated ground and thus worked. I mean, this is ridiculous stuff to us, but it was serious to the Pharisees. They had law after law after law after law. Sadly, they didn't realize when you are no longer serving God out of joy, you are no longer serving God. You see, legalism never brings joy. It only brings burdens. And and God didn't mean for the Sabbath to be a burden. He wanted it to be a blessing. And that is what he wants Sunday to be as well. So we ask the question, how can we 
celebrate this gift without all the legalistic tangles? Well, we do what God tells us to do, rest. And, and first, we can rest in God as creator. The Bible begins with the miracle of creation. The fourth commandment was first stated, connecting it to creation. And so each week, when we pause from our work, we remember God's work in creation and we exclaim, what an amazing God we serve. Praise the Lord, how great thou art. When I consider all the worlds thy hands have made, we rest in God as our creator. But we also rest in God's continuing work. You see, though God rested on the seventh day, he's not kicked back in a recliner watching the angels play baseball today. He is still at work. God is active through His Spirit. Countless times in history, uh, God has intervened in the affairs of people in ways that can only be described as miraculous. I mean, was God kicked back in a recliner resting when the Red Sea parted before the Exodus generation? Was God taking a nap when Jesus was raised from the dead? Of course not. God was at work. And, and don't we pray because we believe God is at work? Don't we share the gospel because we believe God is at work in people's lives? Don't we believe God is at work even right here transforming people? If not, why then are we even here today? Because we come here today because God is at work. We want him to work in us and we want to see him work in others. God is not in a recliner snoring. He is in his throne reigning. In John 5, 17, Jesus said, my father's always at work to this very day, and I too am working. And because God still works, we also can rest in God's care. When we step away from work each week and we rest and we worship the Lord, we understand that we trust God to take care of us. And that's totally countercultural. Because our world tells us that the more you work, the more money you can make. And the more money you can make, the more toys you can buy. And the more toys you buy, the happier you'll be. But here's what happens. We find out that the more toys we buy, the more toys we want. And so the more money we need, so the more we have to work. And we end up on a never-ending cycle that doesn't lead to joy and blessing. It only leads to stress and burnout, resentment, and debt. So the Sabbath helps us stop and to say, stop this madness. <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to trust God. I'm going to trust Him to take care of me. We tend to think that work accomplishes the most things. We type A's like me. We got to work. God says really resting in Him gets the most done. See, one of my rancher friends in Texas who is about as much of a workaholic as I know because he works from sunup to sundown every day but Sunday because he says, I believe I can do more in six days with the Lord's help than I can do in seven days on my own. He's right. When we take a Sabbath, God works on our behalf. But if we ignore that Sabbath rest, we won't find miraculous help or provision because God says, well, I guess you got it on your own. If we honor the Sabbath principle, though, We'll find God's help the other six days of the week. How much can God do in six days? Well, have you walked outside and looked up at the stars at night? He did that in one day. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror and realized how fearfully and wonderfully made you are? He created humans in one day. We often will say that God can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. Then how much can he do in one day? And even more, how much can he do in six? We've got to trust the Lord. When we take our Sabbath and trust God, we free him to move in our lives and to provide as only he can. And that causes us then to rest in the worship of God. What does worship have to do with rest? Well, it has a lot. But worship is a different kind of rest than a nap, though I've been in plenty of worship services where I could have taken a good one. <laughs> Cessation from work 
rests the body. Worship rests and invigorates the soul. When you remember that God is creator, that he is still at work, that you can count on his care, suddenly you remember that you need to worship him because God has made everything we need. He's given us everything we need. How can we not pause one day a week, gather with fellow believers, and worship him? And therefore, on the Lord's day, we worship. And in worship, we remember all God has done. We celebrate all he's doing and we anticipate all that is to come. As we worship through songs and prayers and sermons and fellowship with one another, we are refreshed. We realize how desperately we need worship. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We need this day. When you skip the Lord's day and forsake the assembly, you miss out. Resting in worship allows us to delight in the Lord. And do you know what happens when we delight in the Lord? Psalm 37 verse 4 tells us, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Put God first and the other things fall into place. So that's the what we're to do and the how we're to do it. Now, why? Why does God want us to do what he wants. Well, that's verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God wants us to remember his day by keeping it holy because he set the rhythm and that rhythm helps us be our best. See, it's about our benefit. When we pull aside on the Lord's day, we follow God's example. At the beginning of a new week, we need to pause. We need to look back at the previous week. We need to give thanks for what God allowed us to accomplish and, and experience. And then we need to show gratitude that he provided for us and that he took care of us. And then we need to anticipate what he is going to do in the week to come. In Mark 2, 27, Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You know something interesting? The division of the week into seven days cannot be explained scientifically, indicating that it must have been designed by God. All other time periods, like days and months and years, have specific scientific explanations. The day is the period of the rotation of the earth on its axis, and it can be measured to 23 hours and 56 minutes. The year is the time it takes for the earth to orbit the sun, and it can be measured to 365.24 days. A month is approximately the period of the moon's orbit of the earth, and it can be measured to 29.53 days. But there is no such astronomical, naturalistic, scientific explanation for seven-day week, the year and the month can't be divided by seven. Evidently, God designed the rest day for humanity just like he said. There was a rhythm that needed to happen. God even established a Sabbath year in the Old Testament that allowed the land and the animals to rest. So think about this. If God calls farmers to give the land a rest and, and their donkeys a rest, don't you think he cares at least as much for you as he does dirt and donkeys? I guarantee you he does. He cares more for you. That's why he gives you that daily or, or weekly rest. We need rest to be our best. When we rest on a Sabbath, we become refreshed for the other six days of work. When you rest on God's day, the rest of your life falls into place. And so we might say that rest helps the rest. We need it to be our best. So do you need some rest? St. Augustine said our hearts are restless until we find our rest in Jesus. And he said that because Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Many homes today are places of upheaval, busy, scattered schedules, going here and there all the time. 
The Lord's Day is God's way of helping you take a weekly timeout and refocus on what really matters. It's a day of rest from our own labors and a day to delight in the things of God. Ordering our week rightly demonstrates our love for God and blesses us. I think my mom would agree that dad took the lead in making sure our family was at church because she's told me since he passed away, I didn't always want to go to church every time your daddy did. But she's followed through with that same commitment and I followed through with that same commitment in our family because we learned that from dad. And, and, and dad today, you must take that lead as well. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite preachers who pastored Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee for years, includes a convicting challenge to us dads in one of his messages on this commandment. He said this, Dad, make your worship on Sunday your highest priority more important than your work on Monday. Don't give God excuses you wouldn't try on your boss. Imagine calling your employer and saying, I didn't come to work yesterday because we had unexpected company. Or, you know, I was going to come to work, but I was just so tired, I slept in yesterday morning. I don't think your boss would buy any of those reasons for missing work. Do you know what you say to your children when you don't make church attendance a regular habit? You're saying it's nice, but it's not a necessity. But when you go to work every day, the kids know what, that's important. So teach your children what's really important. When you get up and go to worship on the Lord's Day, you're saying, God is important to me. My church is important to me. My brothers and sisters in Christ are important to me. It's powerful, isn't it? It's convicting in our culture where everything else is still just the same on Sunday. Well, this series is about keeping the commandments in our family so that we can win. Well, mom and dad, teaching the next generation starts with you. How you handle the Lord's Day will be how your kids handle the Lord's Day. Sunday is only a fun day when it is used the right day. Through the prophet Isaiah, God shared the benefits of the Sabbath. And in Isaiah 56, verses 6 through 7, we read, All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house. We began this service singing about there's joy in the house of the Lord today. This is one of the texts where that song comes from, and it captures the joy that we have when we come together. And why is there joy? Because we are here with the Lord, along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are observing the Lord's day, His way, and when you do that, there's joy. And there's a time of celebration, and then joy brings rest, and the rest helps us be our best. And so I don't know why you'd want to do anything else. I don't know why you'd want to miss out what God has for you. And so the challenge on this Father's Day is let's order our week rightly. Let's order it rightly. And dads, lead the way. It's not that hard. If it's flooded, put on some boots. If you're not feeling good, go anyway. Because people notice. And it'll affect not only your generation, but the generations that follow.